This will be day one at school for these young horses. And it's really no different than day one at school for a four-year-old child. A lot of people get heavy-handed. They use the whip too much. They get carried away with things, and that's not my style, and it's certainly not Randy's. He has the most patience of any horse person that I know. He is willing to spend the time to do over and over and to do it humanely. I think Randy really builds the trust thing. Trainers that train riding horses basically have a saddle and bridle to deal with. As you can tell by looking at the harness, the harness on driving horses is much more complicated. There's a lot more to it. It's a lot more intricate. It's a lot more adjustments on it as to how you put it on. The second thing is a driving horse has to pull a vehicle in any one of these type of vehicles, whether it be single or pair. To train a horse to drive requires a little more patience, a little more skill, and a little more time. And you have no connection with a driving horse except that trust because you're not attached to them in any way. You can't pat them on the neck, so they've got to really trust you. But Randy's horses, and the way he trains them, almost a bomb can go off and they just, you know, keep going right along. A very small percentage of people have of getting inside their heads. And I, yeah, Randy, Randy has, I've seen Randy do that. He's persistent. You can anticipate when they're going to shy, you can anticipate when they're going to pull, you can anticipate when they're going to do something wrong. Because you want to try to correct them before they do it. That's was, the, I think, his ability to, that he knows his horses so well. And he, he talks to them all the time. He, he calms them, and he just walks and talks to them. I think it's a God-given gift to start with. Randy Bird can take a horse that has never had a saddle on its back or a bit in its mouth and in the space of a few hours, ride carefully around a training ring. The horse has many hours of education yet to come, but with consistent, quiet skill, Randy can teach a horse thoroughly and deeply, communicating with his hands, slowly rubbing the horse's eyes, speaking calmly and quietly. He can create habits that will last for a horse's lifetime. Randy, because of, ex of his experience, has a quicker understanding of what he's dealing with. He was never one to be yelling and waving his hands at horses and getting them more uptight and flustered, where some people, they could get the quietest horse rattled. Randy always was very relaxed around them. He was uh, very dedicated to his training. Please go back to Randy's teenage years when uh, when he was racing standardbreds. Uh, Randy had his driver's license for racing standardbreds at 16. That's a pretty young age. <laughs> and then he'd, he'd be out at the racetrack till late at night and his mom still made him get up and get on the school bus to go to school the next day. Randy Bird's life changed when he read a book by legendary Australian horse trainer, J.D. Wilton. The Horse's Education by J.D. Wilton. And I read that book cover to cover. And it, you know, it's like any book you read, it looks easy when you're reading it. J.D. Wilton was a very successful horse trainer in Australia, um, but he didn't, he didn't go for the publicity or whatever. He was a very low-key person, was more into his horses and his dogs. I was fascinated what that man had done with horses. It totally changed my life. I had the sickest feeling I ever had. Because I had spent my life at that time at horses, thought it was good, other people told me it was good, I knew nothing. When I saw what those fellows could do with horses, and I vowed right then and there, if I couldn't do it like that, I was out of the horse business. I knew I would never be satisfied the rest of my life doing horses if I couldn't do what they did. So determined to track down and learn from J.D. Wilton and to make himself a more complete horseman in the process, Randy set out for Australia. And in the land of kangaroos, he found disciples of J.D. Wilton's who showed him 
the method. Eighty-seven, I believe we would have done our first clinic. The point of the clinics are to, to give people uh, solutions to, to, to their problems, to their horses' problems, to help them understand why these horses are reacting the way they are, and as I said, just to show them my techniques, the things that I've developed over the years, the things I learned from, from the Australian method, J.D. Wilton's, and to make their life and the horse's life safer and better. It's that simple. There were a lot of people that had question about this type of training method. And um, so what they did, and, and our friends again in Australia have done workshops. And uh, so to let people see what it was all about, then that they started having these clinics and uh, inviting people to come and watch and understand the method. My method does call for restraints and as I, as I explain everywhere I go and, and uh, when I'm working at home, they are used very, they have to be used very scientifically and humanely. And I've never had anyone yet leave here worried about the restraints or storm off halfway through the demonstration when they see how they're used, how effectively, how, and they're for the safety of the horse as well as me and the handler, really. I mean, those horses today, they have to be, they're a lot better standing still than bashing around the yard or, or flipping over and doing things. And, and that's what people, when they see how they're used, and when I saw them used properly, I thought, wow, th th this could very well save my life one day. Good. Okay, don't panic, folks. It's fine. This is why this is done in a controlled environment. You notice here the yard's soft. The hobbles themselves are fleece lined. And what I'm doing here is just letting the horse schooling the horse with the hobbles. In other words, educating him to what those hobbles can and will do to him. And in no time at all, they usually realize that they, their mobility has certainly decreased it. Another vital tool that I use is the blindfold. A horse has two independent brain cells, one for each eye, and by excluding the sight from the eye I'm working on, he's far more apt to stand there quietly as he can't comprehend what I'm doing to him because it was a safe, controlled environment, and they know, and they never forget them. There was not a mark on any of those horses, as you to see. That's why I, I, I took the time out to, 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 you know, get their heads down, get them, keep them quiet and relaxed, and that's how this method, that's how I get the results I get. What I'm gonna do next, is I'm just gonna turn him loose and let him feel the Attention on both the roller and the crouper. Psst. Little soul he was. Oh, this fellow's a bit playful. Okay, now all of a sudden the blindfold's off. He's got gear on him that he's never had before. He's got the mouthing rolled around his, his stomach, see? Running back to the crouper strap, the crouper goes underneath the tail. All of a sudden everything tightens. It's foreign, he doesn't understand it, there's all these weird pressures, and in most cases you do react. Not always, always as violent as that. Or... Okay, let's see what Randy's method, or more importantly his success using the method, has attracted some influential patrons in the horse world. The man holding the reins is George Frolic Weymouth. He's a descendant of the DuPonts, an artist, a gardener, and an avid, skilled coachman. Five of his horses were trained by Randy, and he can't say enough about the results. But he'll take a horse and get them come back to you as really made pairs, like put right in the four and then team, like I'd use them right away. And they were all Top quality. They were all top horses. There wasn't a dog in the group. Mickey Bowen is a coachwoman and a judge at events like this one. She has seen too many ill-trained horses not to appreciate Randy's work. What Randy can do is give the horses back their confidence in their environment and their confidence in people. And that's why, in my opinion, he's as successful as he is.
A lot of desperate cases make their way to Randy Bird's stables. Horses that are one last kick, one last bite, rear, or strike away from a terrible fate. But of all the problems that beset horse owners, nothing is more frustrating or paralyzing than a horse that will not go on the trailer. She really doesn't like trailering. She's really stubborn. Uh, she has a little bit of a fear. I wasn't sure if it was claustrophobia or if she's had some type of prior accident that's made her a little bit afraid. But uh, she just really, she's sour with the trailer. She has no idea who I am. Getting this mare to Randy's clinic took two and a half infuriating hours. Randy knows this, but almost nothing else about the horse. Now, however, he has to find a way to get past the horse's pathology about the trailer. And I could tell right then and there this was a horse that definitely wasn't as confident as she needed to be to, to do whatever she was being asked to in life. What I'm doing here, I realized the minute I went to put the bridle on the horse, the horse didn't lead properly. She was being obnoxious, she was throwing her head, she was, you can see here. And the first thing I, I and a lot of this is, is, is just split second timing. I look at them and, and sort of automate, and that's what you call reading. It's hard to explain. I mean, you just sort of, you know, after a while you get that sixth sense, and you hope you have, you know, that'll, that'll work you through these things. Well, at first it was violence. Uh, she would rear right up. She would literally drag people around and she would maybe try to go in and she'd suck back and just rip people right off their feet and she wanted nothing to do with it and she's a pretty dominant mare and she'll try to get that dominance over you fairly quickly. If she was leading properly, she'd load on the trailer. With a small but rapt audience, Randy begins making a connection with the mare. You can see here the power the horse has got. I had to have full control of her. There's no point going out near a trailer that she fears or dislikes when I don't have the proper control on her in the yard. And the yard's a great place to, to get this. It's like a classroom, no different. And here I thought, you know, just, just to soften her up a little whip cracking and noise stimulate the, the, the noise of the whip and, and uh, I just needed that head down. And what she has to realize too, that I'm here to stay, that this, you know, I don't, you know, we're going to get through this no matter what it takes. And again, I would have had to apologize to the crowd and say, hey, bear with me. You know, we've got a problem here that has to be dealt with no matter how long it takes. Okay, folks, we'll just introduce her now to the leading with the whip. This is absolutely vital. Leading with the whip doesn't mean you're flogging the horse with a stock whip. Just a gentle flick. Good. What In fact, does. as you can see, he lovely. barely caresses the flanks, yet the horse, almost that, desperate exactly for some sort of connection, responds immediately. She's got a lot of better chance of going in the trailer with her head like that than stuck up in there like a giraffe like she was. Well done. Good for you. See that head's down immediately now? Well done. You can see already her head's starting to come down a bit. Now she's starting to come down. She's realizing that this is totally different than anything she's ever had done to her probably. And there, now she's starting to, and that's what I watched for. There was just that point her head had dropped and I realized now she's starting to soften up and, and realize that maybe this isn't such a bad place after all. So Mandy was four years old and I had been riding her in the ring for about a season. And one night somebody was skeet shooting. One minute I'm riding quietly in the ring, and the next thing I know I'm coming off. On, I'm asking the horse to turn to the right. The next thing I know I'm coming off on the left. When this accident happened with Mandy, I thought, okay, do I want to be like them and in six years have a horse I still can't trust? Or do I want to take this horse to someone who I know knows what to do with it? And that's, that's why I brought it to Randy. The horse had been here for three months. We had pretty much all the the what I call the bugs taken out of her. She'd been ridden in traffic. She'd been Helen was very confident and, and confident with her. And uh, today, uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted her to come back was to let people see that some of these stories can have happy endings. And then in a lot of cases, it isn't the horse's fault. It's that the horse has been ill prepared or not properly prepared for the job people are asking them to do. All right, Helen, we're going to start you off. I'd like you just to 
Walk out. I didn't think she would have any difficulties that would put her in any sort of jeopardy or that we couldn't work it work through or I would never have asked her to do this. Okay, the skeet shooting won't bother her now. Although Mandy the horse barely flinches when the gun fires, Randy's convinced there's another training job that has to be accomplished, and it isn't the horse. What I wanted the, the, to show here was how relaxed Mandy is. She's coming through, nothing, nothing apparent, the exact same route that she will now come through and confront this black tarp. And this could very well happen out in the wild or out in the forest or whatever. Things do change. The horse is a creature habit, and what I try so hard with any of the horses here is to prepare them for any challenge they may meet. And what you're about to see is this horse going into a situation which could happen to anyone at any time on any trail. And we're just going to confront Helena and Mandy with a situation that they hadn't yet experienced and just basically help her work through it. No, I want you to take the same route you did and go over that turn. Just as though you're riding down the same trail every, every week and all of a sudden it, you had a heavy storm and there was a mud hole there. Okay, now watch Mandy's reaction, folks, there, you see? See, she's a bit aloof right now, her ears are up. She's just, you can see, she's, she's not wanting her any part of this whatsoever. Given her choice, the horse would have gone the other way and not, not have done this. I mean, you could have stood there all day and, and if you didn't make the right move, she would not go across on her own. Okay, just sit tight, let her study it. Now you can't go past that point without going over the tarp. Okay, now bring her back in, please. And this is what I've asked you there, get off, lead her across. Let her see you on the ground and uh, just gently work her through this. But in a lot of cases, Helen was lucky. She had us there to, to sort of guide her through. A lot of people don't have that option. If they've never seen the, the program, they've never seen, they don't understand, that's where a lot of problems arise. And this horse was never gonna go across that. Link's a, a full-blooded Hanoverian, and uh, I got Link, gosh, probably 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I guess. And uh, a fellow a few miles west of here had a band of Hanoverians. He, he had, his original stock was imported from Germany. And he'd asked me to, to break some of his horses. Now, Link was running in a mob of about 30 horses. He and another one came first for me to start on. And he, he hasn't grown up. He was that size when I got him. Now remember, these horses were in a herd of 30 or 40. In the herd, they were fairly quiet and docile. You went out there, the whole mob would come around you. All of a sudden, you take them out of that herd. You put them in a, in a different environment. Things change. And I remember well, it was the second or third day I had Link in the yard. And all of a sudden, this big bird stood right in his hind legs. And something clicked. I thought to myself, boy, you and I might get along. I just, he's just such a magnificent animal. And the more I thought about it, uh, I, I kept thinking, boy, what a fabulous horse to own. The connection between Link and Randy really becomes important when a green or unridden horse is being slowly schooled to accept a rider. Using Link to calm and control the horse, a human being is suddenly above the student animal, probably for the first time in its life. When I do get on to ride for the first time, he's seen the human being above his eye, he's a lot less apt to react. And that's not to say they, they don't buck, because they do, I mean, but he's a lot less apt to, to having pre been prepared like this. And we'll see this here. Just look how nicely he works. He just sort of waits to, it's amazing what he puts up with. What I'm doing is just giving this horse some com some company. Link is giving him little confidence, and I want to get this horse through the water. After the first time, there should be absolutely no trouble. Now, if I'm on the ground trying to lead this horse through, there's a good chance one of us are going to get wet, and there's a real good chance it's going to be me. So this way, I use Link, and Link just follows him, and Link's, he's such a powerful big fella. He knows every move. The young horse really follows along, and then at the end, we'll just push him in here. 
we had that horse right where we wanted. We let her think that she was going up the bank and then just eased her in before she knew what hit her. As painless as possible, eh? And once they're in there, it's it's no big deal. I mean, they once they've done that a few times. And then we're gonna walk around and have her walk in peacefully on her own. Now that's a lot safer and easier and drier for me doing it that way than down there on the ground trying to wrestle them in. If you remember when we started and the horse bucked so hard, you were saying to me, if you remember back then I said the horse had the girth on, he never had that before, he had the crouper on, well all of a sudden, two hours later or two and a half hours later, he now has a saddle that weighs probably 40 or 50 pounds. But he has been introduced to the tension, to the pressure on the stomach. You can see the way he's standing here, that's not a problem. And a lot of people don't do that. They would just automatically put the saddle on if he stands fine and then turn him loose with it. And uh, there again, as with the ride, with me up above his eye, the horse has been prepared for this ride. All I want to do here is, is give, him the, you know, give him the experience of having that, that rider on him, having the weight on his back. Okay now, she hasn't seen me get on. She's going to see me here in a minute. I just like him to walk around her yard here a few times just to get used to, to the fact that, you know, he can be ridden, he will be. And you notice here, I'm just tapping him to get him going ahead. The, if, if the more forward he is, the less chance he's going to react, buck or rear or whatever. And yet he's the one that, that bucks so violently when we put the gear on. And this is why those things, I don't worry about them. And you have to remember, this is a couple hours later. It's, it's, but the horse has had a lot of schooling in between in those couple of hours that have made this a lot safer for both of us. All that does is make him more tolerant, more tolerant noises, moving above his eye, above his head. Sometimes getting off the horse can be as dangerous as getting on. I quietly reach forward, grab the bridle behind the horse's eye, and step down. If you lose their mind, you've lost their mouth, totally. And you can't stop them, you're on wheels. And you're on wheels behind a flight animal, which is pretty scary, and things can really mushroom. I mean, if a horse takes off on you and you've lost his brain, you're gonna go with him no matter where he goes. Uh, the horse has no real defense mechanism except to flee. And so, even a leaf that falls on some horses, they're so skittish. It happens so fast, we never know how quick it can happen. Like I say the other day, if a horse went down, and a horse goes over him, you can flip a thing like that. And that could all happen with a question of seconds. I was in the hospital, and Bob Cook, who is a good friend and also is a good friend of Randy's, and they work together in selling carriages, uh, told, recommended him highly. And uh, having a choice between several trainers, I took Bob's word, and I'm very glad that I did. 
Uh, I bought them, the horses from the Amish country up in Michigan. Uh, putting them together as a pair was a natural thing to do. We were coming down the road. Uh, we heard a truck coming behind us. It was an empty hay wagon. And uh, at that point, I pulled the horses over to let the hay wagon pass. The gentleman who was driving it shifted gears and his truck backfired. So needless to say, the horses took off and we were going about 35 miles an hour completely out of control and as we turned to go towards the barn or the farm the uh, carriage upset fell on me and my my groom flew out landed on his feet and there I was pinned under the carriage and the horses stopped and I broke my pelvic bone on my wrist. Well Jim called me from his and I had not met Jim and he had called me from his hospital bed a week later and he, he had anything but given up on the horses, and I guess that's why at the time I thought, wow. He said, Randy, I, I've heard about you, and I don't want to sell my horses. In all my years, I have never been out of control, and this was one time where you were going 25, 30 miles an hour down the road, and you cannot control yourself, and they're just completely out of control, and it's a very uneasy feeling. Randy has a unique method, and I don't know of any trainer in the country that can shoot off a gun in a carriage or crack whips around the, the horses to get them desensitized about noise. And uh, that is something that's amazed me, and I didn't even know that until Bob told me about it. And I thought that was a wonderful choice because they, that's what actually scared them in the beginning. And so it turned out to be a wonderful choice, I think. So backfiring trucks shouldn't bother them anymore. I'm starting to get ready now to go out with her. She's a lot more at ease with me. She, I think she's starting to trust me now and realize that I'm not going to hurt her in any way. The bridge isn't a whole lot different than the trailer, other than it doesn't have the roof on it. It has a ramp with a hollow sound. It's, they have to walk up over it. It's confined. There, there's a railing on both sides. What I like to do is warm them up to it, and this is a wonderful warm up. Only if and when she's walking across this easily and at will do I, would I ever ask her to go on the trailer. We're going to reverse directions on the bridge now. See where her head's at, that's exactly where it should be. The battle was really won on the bridge because I knew if I could get her over that, the trailer's nothing. I, the, one, the war was won out there, and then the trailer was nothing. I mean, I'd already conquered her out there, and I'd done it in a nice way. She wasn't the least bit upset, so when I got to the trailer, and that's what I call warming them up, and it's a thing, I never know why I do what I'm gonna do. I look at the situation, and, and it hits me then, you know, and that's what you have to be able to do. You have to read the horses. You have to get inside their minds and figure out why they're reacting the way they are and what you can do to, to counter that. When I got to the trailer, I realized we would go one step further. We would just, what I call, soften her up a little more. You notice I didn't lead her directly into the trailer. I let her walk by it, just get familiar with it, realize that, hey, you know, uh, this isn't any scarier than the bridge just was. And then when I, and I watch her all the time, keep, make sure her head's still down. As long as she's quiet and relaxed, and yeah, there really wasn't any doubt. I mean, maybe not right then, but she definitely would go on the trailer. I wasn't the least bit worried about that. This time, I'm just going to read and see how this goes. Okay, that's a much better than I ever expected at this stage of the game. Now, I'm not going to pull up change the rain pressure at all. I'm just going to walk in and see if she'll follow me. Very good. This horse, as I said before, was taught to lead with a whip. And I think you right there demonstrated the value of that. Well, she just walked right on. I was like, is this even my horse? Like, I almost cried. I almost cried. It just gave me goosebumps, and my mother's thrilled, and I'm excited to show now. I'm excited. Okay, if I could get Liz, or owner, to come over, please. Horses are big, strong animals, and if they don't want to do something, you can get really hurt. 
it's hard to have a horse with a problem, especially when you're not sure how to fix it. So when somebody like Randy comes along and they can fix your horse for you and teach you how to make it all better, it's just wonderful. Right up in, please. Okay, now we're gonna ask you Liz to quietly just turn and gently back her up and I want you to stop her three times on the ramp. I'll tell you when, please. Whoa, right there. As I was explaining yesterday, the idea of stopping on the ramp as opposed to backing them right out, it, there's less chance of them wanting to rush off. If they're getting the habit of having to stop, that lets them, it, it sort of confuses them. They realize they have to, and they're more apt to wait for your command. Okay, Liz, one more step, please. And I'll stop when I tell you, please. Now, right there, good. Just reassure her, just rub her head, rub her eyes there, just let her realize that. Okay, now if you just gently back her down now. We're gonna do this one more time with her and put her back in. We'll repeat this throughout the day. I, I wanted her without a doubt the horse to realize that, hey, this just wasn't once a month to go to the show or do a vet or something. This is what I say to people. It's, it has to be a way of life. And it takes maybe three minutes to load them on the trailer and, and it's no big, they're creatures of habit. If they do this three or four times a week, then it, it, that's what they expect. Just reassure her there. Excellent, okay, if you back her right down now, please. If you noticed, I was, I was coaching Liz exactly the way I had loaded the horse that morning. So Liz, obviously, the horse has no more fear of Liz than me. Therefore, if she does exactly the same motions that I went through, why would the horse not, not follow through? And now she's walking on and off and just doesn't care. It's just, it's incredible. Blows my mind. Let her get her nose right down, Helen. Be ready with her, though. That's good. Okay, hold tight. Very good. This is the real world. I mean, it's it's yeah. not a controlled riding okay. ring or an indoor arena. This is what can go on. And in, in all honesty, that could be a mud hole on the trail. A big, black, dark hole that, that they don't see the bottom in. Randy knows the horse would ride across the tarp if he were on her back. He also knows Helen is sending signals to the horse that is making Mandy very nervous. The horse was a dangerous horse when she it's came in here. Helen's confidence had been absolutely shattered with her accident with the horse. And what I really wanted people to see was, hey, you know, here was a problem horse that very well could have ended up in a not very pleasant situation or on the other side, a wonderful, useful horse that Helen could enjoy for all of her riding years. I think the technique he uses makes the horse focus on the actual person that is working with them. And it gives them confidence first in Randy, because he's the trainer. And then over time, as you follow through on what he did with your horse, it gives them confidence in you. But even through all this, you see Mandy's quiet. Look at the crowd, everything's different here. See how relaxed and confident she is. This isn't unusual. I mean, as I said before, they're creatures of habit. And in her eyes, that's a big, dark, deep hole. Okay, we're gonna let her off with that. Okay, Ken, if we could have the tarp switch, please. The second day, we switched tarps. We went to an orange tarp, bright, Did shiny, and of course, it's different than the black tarp. So it's up to Helen to help her, uh, help her through this. Excellent, keep going, well done. She had to be shown once she had the confidence to cross that tarp and had done it a few times, probably never again will she have a problem with that. They're creatures of habit, and they retain those habits, good or bad. Excellent, folks. Let's have a ride. Isn't that wonderful? Well done, Helen. I got an email from Helen three or four weeks later, and she was actually riding on reforestation, came across one of these big mud holes, and it was right to Mandy's knees, and Mandy went through it. And it, this very well could have been because of this schooling she got right here.
His name is Doonan, named after the uh, gentleman who owned him first and uh, sent him to Randy to be trained. And so uh, his name was Tommy Doonan, and so one is named Tommy and one's named Doonan. Doonan and Tommy were in, in the back, in the wheel. I had two of my other horses in the lead. We were coming down a steep hill, and I told the brakeman to put on the brake, and the brake handle broke off. And this big, heavy vehicle rolling, these two horses came back, and actually, they had their 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 buttocks right under the t pressing against the wood of the carriage, and they stopped that carriage. They saved our lives. So we would have careened down that hill, and that did it for me. They, I mean, they're unbelievable. They didn't run, which is the natural instinct when the wood hit them, but they backed right into that carriage and stopped it, and that did it. I mean, it was pretty dramatic. Because of those two horses, Gary, and he said this to me different times, he said, Randy, they completely changed my life in, in, in driving. And before, his driving was always a struggle. When you put a foreign hand on a coach, a lot can go wrong, you know, and it can be very horrifying. And if you're at a meet and your horses are acting up, there is no fun. It's, 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 you worry about it going there, you worry about it all the time you're there. With those two horses, and then, as a result of those two horses, he went and bought the other three. So a good riding or driving horse has to steer properly. They have to make tight. They have to be agile. They have to be... It, it, they just make a lot better horses. You're on a tight trail, and you can't go that way or that way. And when you can spin them on a dime, it, it just makes a lot better horses out of them. I'm going to ask for a half turn, and to get my half turn, I just gently apply a little bit of pressure and hold. This is what this is what we call mulling the horse up. We're actually teaching the horse to steer. There we go. See that? She gave to it on her own. Now I'm just going to hold her head right there, and hopefully she'll make the turn on her own. The minute she makes the turn, I release. We're getting her accustomed to bit pressure both sides, and then eventually pressure on both sides, or like both sides at the same time. And a lot of people would, would they long line, they do this for a month or two. This is where I do it. I, I teach them to steer in here, I teach them to back up. It's a nice controlled environment. And not only that, the horses learn to bend. Randy is a very rare trainer of any kind in horse business. Plus, he's one of the few trainers, most trainers that train riding horses do not have the capability of training driving horses. Most driving horses trainers don't have the capability of riding them. So it's a very rare combination that you can get one trainer that's capable of doing both. The most important things are, of course, stopping and standing. If you want to stop and talk to someone, if you need to stop like this for lunch, as we're all lined up here and these horses are standing here, it's not a natural thing for them to do. When, they, when they're stopped, they're usually grazing or walking. And also to respond to you, to, to uh, move forward. See, in carriaging, you don't have your leg around them, so they have to listen to your voice. And so you've got even a double uh, difficulty there that they have to be perfectly trained to listen and respond. Very simple to talk about, but very hard to achieve. Well, we're really witnessing a historic event uh, for the first time in over 100 years at least 30 park drags, which are wonderful private uh, vehicles. Uh, never this amount ever assembled, to my knowledge. At least we know for at least 100 years. Hey, how are you? Good seeing you. We like to go 
and see some of the horses that have been through the facilities actually doing what they're what they're supposed to do. To see that restored and, and being lived today is fascinating because I don't know where else that you would ever see it. If there's an apex to driving horses, you'll find it in the world of coaching. Rare, late 19th century vehicles, constructed of the finest woods, leathers, twinkling with polished brass, hooked up to a team of four of the finest horses. Without a lot of effort, costs can escalate past half a million dollars for one of these rigs. But you need more than money for this pastime. Finding a park drag or one of its cousins and pairing it up with a team of well-trained horses requires commitment and passion. And on this day, in the quiet Virginia countryside, a moment in history is taking place. What you may not expect to see in a day like this, a day literally steeped in history, is the sense of easy fun. For instance, if a problem is holding up the procession, no need to worry. It's the perfect time to break out the champagne. The day is, perhaps above all, a social occasion. Finally, it is a day for people who love horses. Their high-spirited freedom, displayed by the toss of their heads, the satisfied gleam in their eyes, the confidence of their gaits. He has seen a lot, he has a lot of experience, he's seen a lot of different types of horses, so nothing particularly flusters him. It's a name that's respected, I mean, among the horse world. I know several cases where he's been the last stop. I do. And it's, it's very good to know that there is a place to give a horse a last chance. Randy Bird's special talent is harnessing the best parts of these magnificent animals, their trust and their essential goodwill. You've heard Randy say over and over, horses are creatures of habit. Some of these stories can have happy endings. And then in a lot of cases, it isn't the horse's fault, it's that the horse has been ill-prepared or not properly prepared for the job people are asking them to do. If I can make a horse, an owner's life safer and better, and I feel I've done my job.